In a recent video, pictured here, I looked back at a bunch of save files from my PS1 days of NASCAR Thunder 2004, and we discovered some amazing stuff. But I did say in that video that if you wanted to learn more about a certain character that I came up with as a child, <laughs> Just let me know in the comment section. There was a surprising number of people that commented and a surprising amount of likes on those comments. I am shocked at how badly people want to hear about this while we get started. I have in my possession a bunch of notebooks from my childhood. And um, there are so many things that we could talk about. But we're going to just start here. I have way more than just these, by the way. There are many, many more notebooks. We, this could be a series. This series could carry us for another 10 years, dude. I'm telling you. I look back at some old stuff. I basically pieced together the storyline as best as I could. But, um, there's still some gaps of information here. But this is what I believe the story was from the start and what I think makes the most sense for the story. So why don't we get started? And you asked for this. You asked for this. Let me emphasize the fact that you asked for this, okay? This is the complete story of Nick Knack and Knack Knack, as told by third grade Kamikaze Games. Okay, so pretty much start to start things off, um, Nick Knack and Knack Knack are brothers who race in the Cup Series, among other things. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna make like the chronological timelines, because I think that's the most, that's the way that to tell the story makes the most sense. When I was in third grade and I came up with these characters, um, I had to ride home on the bus. And the bus route always took us past this thrift store. We'd always ride past this place on the bus ride home. I'd always look over, and it was a store called Nix Nax, which is obviously a play on the word, you know, knick-knack. Like, um, you know, trinket, or whatever, you know. You know what I'm talking about, English vocabulary. And that's basically where I came up with the name, was Nick knack I was a clever child, let's just say. So, Nick knack his full name is Nicholas Neculus. This is already fantastic. He was born on August 12th, 1975. He has an older brother named Bill Naculus, otherwise known by his nickname Knack Knack, who was born on December 1st, 1971. These two brothers were born to the dad named Arden Naculus, who was a huge uh, Cup Series driver in his time, a multi-time champion. So, being the child of a famous race car driver, it should surprise absolutely nobody that Nick especially wanted to be a race car driver from the start. But the problem for um, this family is that the older brother, Bill, or Knack Knack, actually wanted to be a motocross racer. <laughs> So he went into motocross racing as a teenager and kind of ignored um, the sport of NASCAR until their father, Arden, came down with a serious illness in around 1990. Uh, Bill was an adult at this point, a, uh, over age 18. He was touring in motocross and trying to become, you know, a huge name in uh, uh, motocross MX racing. All the while, Nick Knack is still a teenager and still living at home. And Arden fell sick very quickly. His condition deteriorated very rapidly. And um, Bill never got a chance to get home before his dad died. But Nick was always by his side the whole time. And basically, Nick promised that he was going to make his dad proud. He was going to do everything in his power to become the greatest Cup Series or NASCAR driver in general of all time. He was going to put in the work. He was going to do it. And unfortunately, Bill never got back in time to uh, 
uh, see his dad before he died. So that is very devastating. But still, despite it all, um, Bill obviously feels a lot of guilt over this. And he is easily manipulated. <laughs> he is a very easily manipulated individual. He is very emotional. And um, so when he was approached by um, Robert Yates, actually. Yates approached him and said, you know, we heard that your dad died. We're very sad. We understand at this organization what it's like to deal with tragedies <laughs> here at Yates. It's kind of our business. And um, they offer him a developmental contract in the Bush series to drive a Havoline number 28 in the Bush series while developing for the Cup series. And he jumps on the opportunity. Like, he, he still regrets not being there for when his dad died, and he kind of felt like his dad was disappointed in him because he wanted to go into motocross instead of uh, uh, soft car racing. So uh, Bill goes, okay, sure, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's make it happen. Bill is a good racer, but like, he's like Jamie McMurray level good. Like, he has his moments, he has hawk flashes, but he's not exactly tearing things up. He's not exactly, like, um, burning the series to the ground. So he's having a modest level of success. He's winning a few races here and there, but he's never really a championship contender. Everything changes when Nick is finally old enough to race, because all throughout his teenage years, he watches all the broadcasted races, even though there's, you know, it's difficult to keep up with because, you know, 90s. He's, um skipping school in order to, you know, watch this stuff, and he's like, he's going all in to racing. He is doing everything that he can. And he even sneaks into, um, the racetrack and into the garage area, um, during, uh, race weekends. And, like, his, and, like, um, Bill's always like, what are you doing, kid? <laughs> You're gonna get thrown out. You're gonna get banned from the series. But Nick's like, no, man, I, I just have to be here. I have to be here. I need to study. I need to learn. One of these races, um, Nick is actually approached by Brian France himself. Now, it's the early 90s. Brian is not the boss of the sport yet. But he is approached by Brian France. Bill's like, oh god, we're gonna get banned from the sport because my little brother snuck into the racetrack. Illegally. <laughs> is trespassing on this racetrack. He's freaking out. And it's basically like, B -b -b nothing's going on here, Brian. My brother was just leaving. And Brian's, you know, high off his ass. And it's just like, oh my goodness. The world famous, you know, Neculus driver has a brother I've never met. And he's like trying to talk to Nick. And it's just like, what's your name, kid? What's your name? Do you race? And Nick's like, yeah, my name is Nick. Brian's just like, oh my goodness. Nicholas. Neculus. What a name. It's almost as if a third grader came up with the name. And he's like, I can see the name and lights now. Nick Knack. And then he kind of looks over to uh, Bill and he's like, Didn't you race motocross? Maybe your name can be Knack Knack. It's all very contrived. So Bill is basically taken aback by this. He's like, this man is high off his ass. And he just basically pushes Nick out of the situation because Brian's offering him drugs or whatever. You know, and he's just trying to get out of the situation. But Bill sees a terrible influence, a horrible influence on his younger brother and tries to push him out of the situation. But Nick, being a teenager, is like, Hey, yo, what are you doing? I'm talking to the son of the NASCAR CEO and you're trying to get me to leave? Are you fucking serious, bruh? Basically, and that's like, that's the beginning. That's the beginning between, between the rift that it comes between these two that is the crux of their storyline. So, there is, this is a very in-depth story, okay? I did nothing as a child. This is what I did as a child other than play video games, okay? This is the only other thing that I did. I had no life. So I came up with this bullshit. So, as the years go on, um, um, Bill is still having issues. He's, you know, winning a few races here and there, but he's never really broken out. So, he's still in the Bush series, and he's still with Yates, actually. He's still in the Bush series with Yates once we get to 1995. Now, 
Um, Nick Knack is finally old enough. He got, he got, um, he's been, you know, breaking his way into the series, and he's finally gotten an offer. He gets an offer from none other than Gene Haas. So in this universe, Gene Haas comes into the sport a little bit early and puts all of his investment into a Bush Series car with a, you know, second generation racer behind the wheel. You know, it's, and like, he's assuming that the sponsorship is gonna come from there. <laughs> oh, big mistake, Gene. Anyway, this is the, uh, this is the 90s, where just being the son of a famous race car driver doesn't get you automatically into the series. Unlike today! Uh, anyway, so, for the 1995 Bush Series season, um, Knack Knack is still with his development team, with Yates, he's still in the Haviland 28, and basically all the media is saying is like, you know, why aren't you in the Cup Series yet? You've been in development for so long. I mean, even though the Bush series isn't a development series for a few more years, but ignore that! Ignore that! Ignore that! They're still like, why haven't you been put into the Cup Series yet? And he's like, oh, it's because, you know, we just haven't got enough money, and like, you know, the Cup team is always full and stuff, because Yates only ever had two cars at any point, you know, they're an F1 team, they don't have enough space. All the while, his younger brother's coming into the series, and everyone's really focused on him because it's looking like he's gonna be a huge prospect, because of all the, you know, training that he'd been doing throughout his teenage years. So now he's 20 years old, he's made it to the Bush series, he's with an upstart team in the double zero, and, and he's basically like, I'm here, I'm here, and I'm ready to win. And what does he do? He puts the double zero car on the pole for the Daytona race. And now all the media can talk about is how, oh boy, he's here. Nicholas Neculus is here, guys. You gotta be ready for this, and everyone's, you know, coming up to Knack Knack like, Oh my goodness, your brother, he's looks so good, your brother's great, your brother's great. And he's, and he's starting to think, oh no, I'm starting to fall out of the uh, public zeitgeist, and everyone's, um, everyone's getting on me for not being good enough. And at, in this Daytona race, um, um, Knack Knack's 28 car is extremely overpowered. He is, it's like, think... Dale Jr. in the 2006 Bush Daytona race, where he led literally every lap. Well, that's basically the speed that this 28 car has. He's leading late, there's a big gap between him and second, everyone behind him is drafting with each, with each other, but no one can catch up to him. And it's a couple of laps to go, and everyone's like, oh my goodness, no one can stop him. But then, um, Nick is running f in fifth place, and no one's working with him because he's a rookie, right? Well. He somehow manages to find a way in the draft to be able to pull up behind the fourth place car and basically slingshot around him and self-clear without the help of the spotter. And it's like, amazing. The crowd's going wild, MRN is absolutely shitting themselves, they can't believe that someone was actually able to make a pass without help at Daytona. And like, he keeps doing that, he's basically rolling up through the uh, top five and like, on the stand for for uh, Knack Knack, they're like, Nick's making a bunch of moves, and he's like, how is he making a bunch of moves? This package is shit. And he just, you know, he's just found something in the draft. Haas found something in the draft. They decided to max out arrow instead of um, engine for this race. You know, this is how it goes. So it comes down to the final lap. Down the back stretch, it's Knack Knack in the lead, Chad Little in second, and Nick Knack in third. Down the back stretch, Nick makes the same move that he'd made to get up through the top five, but Chad blocks him all the way down low. Um, Nick just runs into him because, you know, he didn't have anywhere to go, so he just runs into him, transfers his momentum, and now Chad Little has the run on Nick. So Nick's like, oh my god, he just throws it to the left to try and, you know, hold the spot. He's held the lead for the entire race. He knows that he's going to win this race if he just holds on to the lead. So he pulls it to the left, blocks Chad Little, but they make contact. It actually slows them both down. Nick goes to the outside, and they're side by side coming out of turn four, side by side to win the opening race at Daytona in the Bush Series 1995 season. But they're neck and neck. They're slowing each other down with the side draft. It comes down to Chad Little, who's still running the inside line. But because Mac came down and blocked him and nearly wrecked, you know, everything, 
Chad Little decides to go high and push Nick to the win. And push him to the line to win by like a couple hundredths of a second. So there you have it. Nick Knack is a winner in his first ever Bush Series race. And he's like, holy shit, how the fuck did that happen? And Knack Knack is saying the same thing. Bill's just sitting there like, I lost. I, I can't believe I lost again. I've lost another race. And it's, of all people, to his younger brother. And it's just like, he should be happy. But he can't be happy, because he knew he could have win. And he knows that the media is going to get on him even harder than ever. This, this story is basically just like, anti-media. <laughs> the media sucks. Can you believe that me of all people would come to this conclusion? But it isn't until Brian France himself comes to Victory Lane to congratulate him. And he's like, congratulations, Nick Knack, you've done it. And he's like, um, could we at least use my full name? I, I thought that I was the famous son of Arden Knackulus. No one knew him, no one ever knew him as Arden Knack. No one ever referred to our family as the Knacks. But then Bill Fr or Brian France points up to the Goodyear blimp that has lights on the side that say Nick Knack wins at Daytona. And he's like, that's your identity now, kid. You gotta use it. And that's basically it. That's how we got the nickname. And that's basically how it goes. We um, jump forward in time at this point, because, you know, I have no resources to tell us otherwise. After that, Nick Knack is a pretty much unstoppable force in the Bush series. Um, he goes on to win the 1996 Bush series championship and the 1997 Bush series championship, ultimately being moved to the Cup series, still racing for Haas, in 1998 for his rookie season. Knack Knack, on the other hand, he does make it to the Cup Series. In fact, he makes it to the Cup Series in 1996 into, finally, Yates opening up a third entry. And the number that I picked for him all the way back as a child was 32. I don't know why I picked 32, but that's just what happened. So not a whole lot of interesting stuff happens at this point. We just have to roll our way into the new millennium. Um, just basically the same thing, it's the same thing that, um, happened in the Bush series for Knack Knack. He, he's always getting outrun by Dale Jarrett, like, Dale Jarrett still wins the 1999 championship. And, like, the 28 car in the Cup series is still being driven by a bunch of different people. Because, you know, Yates just couldn't nail down anyone. But, um, Knack Knack's in the 32. He's doing fine, he's got seven career wins going into, um, 2003, but, um, he's never really been, you know, the guy. He has never been that guy. He's never been a championship contender, is what I'm trying to say. As for Nick, he gets into the Cup Series in 1998 for his rookie year, but he's racing for Haas, and Haas is an absolute pile of shit. <laughs> so, it takes a long time, but eventually, as 2001 rolls around, Haas has finally built themselves into a respectable organization. And in 2001, instead of um, Robbie Gordon winning the final race of the year at New Hampshire, it is actually Nick. Nick is the one that bump and runs Jeff Gordon. <laughs> Nick is the one that bump and runs Jeff Gordon in the 2001 finale of the Cup Series. And this is important for later. 2002... Basically, Nick Knack is a combination of Tony Stewart and Mark Martin, where he wins four races for the Haas team, but finishes second in points to Stewart. Um, so, unfortunately, he doesn't have the championship to his name, but 2003 is looking to be his breakout year. But that, everything changes. Everything changes for 2003, because um, Robert Yates finally gives up the ghost, he finally gives up on the Knack Knack project and lets him go at the end of the 2002 season. He's actually picked up by a different team entirely. Do, do I have it in here? I don't have anything in here. I have, so I have uh, Yates and Haas, but like, I don't have anything else. The team that I have for, um, 
for Knack Knack on here is just called a century. All it says is century. So it's going to be a century before we figure out what that's supposed to mean. But it's just some random Chevy team is what I'm trying to say. And then Robert Yates does the funniest shit you could ever imagine. He hires Mick. He hires his brother, Mick. He replaced one Maculous brother with the other. So now Mac Max had an even worse inferiority complex. Like, he's just on some random team that no one's ever heard of while his younger brother just steps into his old car. And, um, Mac Max takes the number 32 with him. So, um, Yates decides to change things up entirely. Yates decides to give Nick Knack not the 88 car, but he puts a 1 in front of it and makes it into the 188 car. <laughs> Very creative stuff, I know. And now we get to 2003. Oh my goodness. In reality, the 2003 Daytona 500 ended like two laps after halfway thanks to rain. Boring is what I think. In this universe, the Daytona 500 goes all the way to the last lap. And can you believe that it's Michael Waltrip leading Jeff Gordon, Nick Knack, and Knack Knack. It's basically a replay of the 1995 um, Bush race that we started out with. Coming down to the final lap, um, you know, there's this internal struggle that's been going on between these two all these years. But they're still family. That's what, they, that's what they've done to keep themselves together over all these years. Even though the media keeps trying to tear them apart, even though Brian France is trying to drive a rift between them, they're still family and they're still trying to succeed in racing for their dad who died after complications with something that I've already forgotten. Anyway, the point is, is that they're still brothers, they're still gonna work together at the end of this race. So down the back stretch, Waltrip is in front of Gordon. The Naculus brothers hook up in a tandem draft and go to the inside. And it's just like, it's a replay of 1995. They're coming out of the final corner. But you see, the thing is, is that the inferiority complex has gotten ingrained into Nack Nack's mind at this point. And at this point, he is desperate. He is desperate for any reason for people to stop talking about how he is, you know, a, he is worse than his brother or a, an embarrassment to the family, I guess. You know, that's just his inferiority complex. So at the very last second, coming out of turn four, Knack Knack makes it three wide to the inside of his brother for the win in the Daytona 500 in 2003. Can you blame him, honestly? I bet there's many people that would do the same thing. <laughs> Even though they they needed the draft to beat Walter, but ignore that. Ignore that. Ignore the laws of physics for a second for the sake of the plot. So they're coming side by side to the line. But if you'll remember, back in 2001, at New Hampshire for the final race of the year, Nick Knack bump and ran Jeff Gordon for the win in that race. And Jeff Gordon holds a grudge. All right, Jeff Gordon's holding the grudge. Coming to the line, Gordon just veers to the left and he hits into the 32 car of Knack Knack. And since they were side by side, this takes out both the 32 and the 188. So both Nick Knack and Knack Knack are wrecking into the wall and Michael Walter ultimately goes on to win the race and Jeff Gordon doesn't even win the Daytona 500 so it was completely pointless. <laughs> it was completely pointless from Gordon. It was entirely spiked. I was a very one-note child, it must be said. So there you have it. Michael Walter still wins the 2003 Daytona 500 but Nick Knack and Knack Knack get wrecked by Jeff Gordon and after the race you know, Knack Knack climbs out of his car and is like, damn, dude, that's fucked up. But Nick Knack climbs out of his car and is fucking pissed. He is so mad that Knack Knack thought that he needed to make the three-wide move to win the race and ultimately end up wrecking both of them. And Knack Knack's just sitting there like, bruh, it was Gordon. Gordon wrecked us. It wasn't my fault that we wrecked, but Nick Knack's just standing there like, if you just stayed with me, 
We would have bump draft past Waltrip, and I would be a Daytona 500 winner. And Mac Max just said, and they're like, man, you would have done the same thing if you were in my position. And Nick Max, like, I wouldn't have been stupid enough to leave us vulnerable to something like this. And, you know, Nick Mac Max, like, dude, it's not our fault. You need to blame Jeff Gordon, not me. And then basically, Nick Mac makes it personal and is like, um, yeah, whatever, dude. At least I was actually there when Dad died. And, and, and they're like, and then that like really cuts deep into the insecurity of Knack Knack. And then like all of this building up over the course of like eight years. Eight years of the media telling Knack how, how worse he is compared to his brother. And all of these years of knowing that he, you know, just can't keep up with Nick over all this. They basically start beating the shit out of each other on the front stretch, right in front of everyone. Um, and it's basically just the 1979 Daytona 500. <laughs> it's basically, and there's a fight, pretty much is what it is. But basically, that's how the, the, that's basically how the plot, how their plot kicks off. That's how the plot between these two kicks off, is that because Jeff Gordon wrecked them at, in the 2003 Daytona 500, they hate each other now. So, it's no longer brotherly love. It actually is, like, a really deep and personal beef between these two. And they fucking despise each other. They reach each other way harder than they have any right to. They race each other in practice. Like, basically, everything... Everything from then on is just Nick doing everything in his power to just beat his brother. He just, he just wants to win every race... And he wants his brother to fuck off. That's how pissed off he is. And, you know, and Knack Knack reciprocates. He's like, well, you're a fucking asshole. And he tries to beat him every week, but he never can. And that's basically how the plot goes for the next several years. It kind of is just like this until 2005. Until 2005. 2005 is when Knick Knack actually gets really good. Like, he is winning, you know, races here and there, but he hasn't been a championship contender since 2002. All of this changes in 2005. Like, Yates is firing on all cylinders. He gets, like, you know, 12 straight poles. He is just untouchable. And unfortunately for Knack Knack, this is finally the year that he's breaking out. It's been, like, the dude's been in the Cup Series for a decade at this point. And his random team that I don't even know the full name of is finally starting to get, you know, going again. And it's basically the dynamic of Jeff Gordon and Mark Martin in 1998. Knack Knack's having the best year of his career, but at the same time, Nick Knack is literally unstoppable. He is basically playing on rookie difficulty. He is getting all the poles. He's getting all the wins. He is fucking unstoppable. And every single race... Knack Knack is finishing second, and it's just killing him. It's just killing him how he knows that this is his year if Knick Knack would just disappear. And that's when he starts thinking. That's when he starts thinking. I have to figure out a way to get Knick Knack out of the picture. And maybe not out of the picture, but like, someone needs to throw down with him and put him in his place so that he understands that he is not going to be winning every race ever for the rest of his career. So, Knack Knack decides to step out of his car for a weekend. And he has basically a mercenary. A mercenary takes his place. In my head, it's always been a Dover race that um, Knack Knack gets out of the car. It was always a Dover race. Now, this is actually the first ever story that I wrote with the characters Nick Knack and Knack Knack. This was in third grade, which is why it takes place in 2005. This is when I came up with them. So basically, Knack Knack is sick of losing every week, so he gets out of the car and hires a mercenary. Who is that mercenary, you may ask? Who is this professional race car driving mercenary? 
who exists only to defeat the man who is absolutely untouchable. Lord Clyde from Fisher Lantier's second offense. I was in third grade, okay? If I was actually going to rewrite this story as an adult, I would make it a different character. But for the sake of this video, I'm telling you the story as I wrote it as a child. Not all of this was from back then, though. Like, everything that I said before the 2003 Daytona 500 was all written, like, in high school. When I was in third grade is when I wrote this part of the story, and then, like, a few years later, I came up with the 2003 Daytona 500 as a justification for why these two brothers hate each other so much. <laughs> so, yeah, basically, um... <laughs> Mac Mac gets out of his car for a race, Lord Clyde enters his limo, instead, and is basically running, like, the dirtiest shit that you've ever seen, like, he goes full Logano, and is just wrecking everyone, just trying to keep up with Nick Knack, and, like, he's beating and banging on him, and, like, he's doing everything he can, and he even uses his special weapon for a second, but he can't stop Nick Knack. Nick Knack still wins the race anyway, and, um, goes to victory lane, Lord Clyde, like, shoves aside the, uh, uh, paparazzi and whatever, and he basically walks up to Nick like, I was hired to take you out, and that's what I'm gonna do. And before he can stab him, through the wall comes, um, Convoy. The vigilantes are here to save the day. <laughs> and they chase Lord Clyde off, and that's how the original story ended. So, like, the original story really had nothing to do with the characters. But hey! That's the story. <laughs> anyway! After that, Nick Knack is still an unstoppable force of nature. He wins the 2005 championship. He wins the 2006 championship. He basically does the Jimmy Johnson. Yeah, he does the Jimmy Johnson before Jimmy Johnson even does the Jimmy Johnson. Like, as I'm writing this, Jimmy Johnson was doing the Jimmy Johnson. <laughs> I fucking hate it. Anyway, Nick Knack is still unstoppable. He's got like, you know, 70 career wins at like age 30. And the dude's a fucking menace. He's an absolute menace. And for the next part of the story, the concept of people hating Nick Knack for being completely unstoppable has never gone away. Like, he has so many haters, it's not even funny. And eventually, into the 2008 offseason, like, Nick Knack's won all these championships and upwards of 70 races, and he's just living it up. And he's hanging out in his mansion one night, when he gets a knock on his door. He gets a knock on his door. So he goes up to the door, he opens it up, and it's, um, and there's this car with, like, blacked out windows. And he's like, hey, yo, what the fuck? And, like, they roll down the windows, and it's, like, a guy with a Tech-9, and he just unloads on his house. Someone has hired a hitman to take out Nick Knack for real this time. <laughs> and basically, at some point, um, he figured out that his brother put a hit on him or whatever. And he's like, okay. Okay, I know what's going on here. So he escapes out his back door, he gets into his brand new Ford Mustang, paid for with a Roush Yates engine. And, um, they get into an epic highway chase and whatever. And Nick Knack eventually gets to his brother's house and just starts hammering on the door. And his brother comes out and he's like, what the fuck? It's fucking 2 a.m. What do you want? And, like, Nick's like, what are you doing? You're trying to get me killed again? And Nick and Knack's like, what are you talking about, motherfucker? I'm, I'm literally in my underwear trying to sleep. And then the, uh, car with the tinted out windows comes by and just basically... You ever seen the movie Boys in the Hood where they just unload on the house and, you know... Basically that. Basically that's what happens, except neither of them die. Neither of them die. They both survive. And, like... Knack Knack's like, Holy goddamn shit, my house just got shot up. And Nick's like, Yeah, you motherfucker, what the fuck is this all about? Why are you trying to get me killed? And Knack's like... Okay, dude, I know that what I did in 2005 was pretty fucked up, I will give you that, but this is not me. 
I'm not the one trying to assassinate you this time. And Nick's like, well, what the fuck? So, basically, they have to come together for the first time in, like, the last five, six years. They have to come together and try and figure out who's trying to assassinate them. Now, unfortunately, I don't have that notebook anymore. I don't have the notebook with this story in it anymore. So I don't actually know how the story goes. All I know is that they obviously survive and everything's fine. Everything's fine in the end. And they make up. And they, uh, and they make up for all their differences over the years. And everything's happy. And that's pretty much the whole story. Um, you know, they just, they go on to, you know, keep racing for the rest of their careers and whatever. But like... There's not any more stories that are associated with this. All I know is that after um, they retire, Nick Nack goes on to be a movie star, and Nack Nack goes on to be a FedEx driver. <laughs> That's the entire story afterwards. What is the moral of the story, you may be asking? Um, watch over your kids. Don't let them sink their life into insane fanfiction like this. Let them go outside and fucking play with, like, their bikes or some shit, alright? Don't le leave your children alone with notebooks. <laughs> please. Please. That is the only request that I have. Anyway, like I said, you asked for this. Um, I have, obviously, a lot more lore from my childhood I've been trying to figure out how to share with the internet without cringing too hard. Um, if you enjoyed this video, God help you. But please leave a like, and maybe I'll do more of this. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in whatever it is that I do next. Bye! Warden Compton has been found dead. Well, with a last name like that, it was only a matter of time. Now this is the one game that you don't want any help taking out of you. Oh, I shot Bill Gates. Oh, I'm sorry, Bill Gates. I could crush a weakling like you with one hand. This book bears no significance in the community. I'm not even getting your intelligence from it. It must be the Wall Street Journal. I gotta say, this is pretty impressive. I haven't had this much fun in a while.